team. We are here today to talk about a fascinating evolution in American medicine. At the start of the Civil War, the American medical field was rudimentary. It was unsanitary and wildly unprepared to deal with the bloodiest conflict on the United States soil. However, this historical moment of a pivotal social and political change saw medicine evolve quickly to meet the needs of the time. This period brought significant advances in medical science, including women and African-Americans moving into the field officially for the first time. The Civil War marked a revolution in Western medicine as a whole, laid the foundation for the system that we know today. And so today we are here with a distinguished Civil War historian and filmmaker, Carol Adrian, Adrienne, um, who will discuss her new book, Healing a Divided Nation, and uncover the unlooked story of American innovation, one that took place on the medical tents away from the battlefield in real time. And we will explore how this remarkable and bloody transformation of Civil War medicine in its cultural and historical context, really changed the face of medicine and the role that Capitol Hill played in the development. Our featured guest today, Carol Adrian, received her BFA from Moore College of Art and Design in Philadelphia. She organized an archive for the old St. Joseph's National Shrine, twice chaired Archives Week in Philadelphia, and served on the advisory panels for the Philadelphia Archdiocese Historic Research Center. The Mutter Museum Civil War Museum Medicine Exhibit and its Spit Spreads Death, the 1918 Flu Epidemic Exhibit. She is currently working on a documentary film series on the Civil War. So it is my privilege to hand a gavel over to Carol. Please tell us what you learned. Thank you, Jane and Sam. Thank everyone today for joining me. I am very honored by the invitation of the United States Capitol Historical Society to talk with you today and to share some amazing stories and facts about the Capitol, Congress, and Civil War medicine. I'm a filmmaker, as Jane said, I'm working on a four part series about civil, the Civil War medicine. And I received an offer a couple years ago to write a book on the subject. So having done quite a few years of research with primary source materials, which include letters, diaries, memorabilia, periodicals and pub publications of the era, uh, I learned some fascinating things about Civil War medicine. Well, the Civil War was a dramatic turning point in American history and medical history. The Civil War gave us ambulances, trained nursing care, specialty hospitals, common use of anesthesia. It was quite an event in change. Now, the story though struck me as an example of extreme heroism. This was about Americans at their best. It was a story that involved Northerners, Southerners, men, women, black and white. It was a tale of incredible compassion and courage and action on the part of thousands of American men and women who provided medical care in the face of unbelievable and seemingly unending violence and horror. Next slide, please. So today, I would like to talk to you about the role that was played by the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C., the building itself, and the body of Congress. Well, it also struck me in telling this story that I'm going to approach it in this way, that the building really represents the body and Congress represents the spirit of America. So Congress is intended to serve as the voice of the people of America and the Capitol is our national stage. So you may already know that 
Article I of the United States Constitution established the legislative branch, which is known as Congress. The two divisions are the Senate and the House of Representatives, and they are represented by delegates elected by all of the states. Well, this building goes back quite a ways. And in fact, next month in September, it will be 230 years ago when our first president, George Washington, laid the cornerstone for the building. Slide, please. Uh, as the United States grew in territory and added more states, Congress was becoming very crowded. And by 1850, the number of states in the Union had doubled. And so plans were made to enlarge the building and add a new dome to better suit it. New slide. And let's take a look at this very famous American icon, the dome of the building that houses this vital group. Slide. Architect Thomas Walter, these are his beautiful drawings, um, was chosen to design the capital expansion and the new dome. There was a dome originally, but this one was much bigger. So the construction of the new dome began in 1856 before the war, and it was completed in 1866, the year after the war. It is made of cast iron and it weighs 8,909,200 pounds. And the walls of this iconic dome are hollow. There's a kind of secret stairway with 365 steps for maintenance, cleaning. And the cost of the dome in the Civil War period was $1,047,291. Now, in today's dollars, that would be equivalent to about 38 or $39 million. New slide, please. Okay, we're gonna jump right in. When the Civil War started, America faced 1 million casualties. When it began, no one expected this war to last as long as it did or to be as deadly as it was. So we're going to look at the remarkable advances and changes that were affected in Civil War medicine by Congress and the moral courage and fortitude that was exhibited by the healthcare workers of the American Civil War. These were the people who exhibited what our President Abraham Lincoln termed as the angels of our better nature. Well, what caused this horrible toll? I'm gonna to give you some perspective with a five minute high speed crash course through the creation of this hideous nightmare situation that led to more than 1 million casualties in a country where it is estimated that possibly as many as 300 doctors in America, the entire country had ever witnessed surgery or even seen a gunshot wound. Slide. So one of the most important causes of all this devastation was the technology of weapons. Now, within two and a half to three years, this technology exploded, so to speak, and advanced. Um, new slide. This is the most common weapon in America before the war. This is the Springfield smoothbore musket. It used a round ammunition, kind of like a fat marble, usually made out of lead, occasionally of stone. It was loaded into the weapon from the far end of the barrel, wrapped in a piece of fabric so that it didn't bounce around in that smooth barrel on its exit. And it was, you got it down there with a long slim tool called a ramrod. So this smooth bore musket could fire one round a minute reliably. If you were really good at it, maybe you could do two. But then along came new ammunition. So slide, please. In the middle, you see a musket ball. And on either side, even though they're called mini balls, they are bullet-shaped projectiles. These were invented by French Army officer Claude Etienne Mini. And they're bigger and they're heavier and they're a different shape. But the truly defining difference in these projectiles are those grooves at the base. Well, what they did was to groove the inside of those smooth rifle barrels so that it grabbed that ammunition. It spun it, it, it gave it a much more 
predictable trajectory, more accuracy, and it is estimated that most of the gunshot wounds of the Civil War casualties were caused by the new ammunition, the mini ball. So another uh, advance, and slide please, this is the Springfield Model 1861 musket. It was the single most widely used musket during the war. And the soldiers were really emotional about this weapon. They found it beautiful. It really was beautifully engineered. The wood was highly polished, as was the metal. And they, they waxed rhapsodic about this gun. Now, the difference was is that this gun had a rifled barrel. So uh, loading was a little bit easier. And this gun could fire about three rounds a minute. Well, slide please, there was another advance by Christopher Minor Spencer, an inventor from Connecticut, and he created the first reliable repeating rifle. Now, these guns could fire 20 rounds a minute. So we went from one or two rounds a minute to three rounds a minute to 20 rounds a minute. This really kicks up the action in warfare. Well, the next advance which is the great granddaddy, thank you, of AR-15s, the AK-47 assault rifles. This is the Gatling gun. The Gatling gun was six rifle barrels that were attached to a metal cylinder that was cranked by hand. The gun could fire 200 rounds a minute. And as you can see, it was easy to move around and angle. This weapon was an incredible killing machine. It changed the face of battle and warfare. And one of the most interesting things about it, uh, new slide please, was it was invented by a medical doctor. Dr. Gatling uh, was an inventor. He created a lot of agricultural tools that really revolutionized American agriculture. But in his late 20s, he contracted smallpox, from which he fortunately recovered. And then he decided to go to medical school. So he attended medical school in Ohio. Um, and afterwards, during the war, he saw all the broken bodies of the men returning from the war, the numbers of deaths, the deaths from disease. He was horrified and saddened by this awful situation. And here I want to read you what he said about the um, slide, please, about the gun, which was, I, I realized that if I could invent a gun, which could, by rapidity of fire, enable one man to do as much battle duty as a hundred, that it would, to a great extent, supersede the necessity of large armies and consequently exposure to battle and disease be greatly diminished. So he thought he was going to stop war. Well, it wasn't just the weapons that were causing the deaths. Um, slide, please. It was also the rampant diseases, pneumonia, smallpox, typhoid, diarrhea, and dysentery killed thousands, and what were commonly known as the childhood diseases, measles and chicken pox were deadly. There was rheumatic fever. It was just a terrible smorgasbord of diseases, many of them communicable. So what did they have to combat these things? Well, it was pretty limited. Um, side the, the uh, medications most commonly were opium and uh, quinine. Quinine had actually been in use for some centuries. It was made from cinchona bark from South America, and it had been used successfully to cure malaria or at least modify the symptoms. And opium as a painkiller, when I looked at the lists of over-the-counter medications available in the 1860s, it seemed that most of them contained opium. Now, they did have anesthesia. We have a slide. Um, they had ether and chloroform. Now, uh, they were at the beginning of the war, 
administered in a pretty crude way in a soaked cloth that was placed over the mouth and nose of the injured soldier. But they had their own drawbacks. Now, chloroform, which was effective, um, and gave both of these gave the surgeons about a nine-minute window to successfully perform surgery with a patient who was fully unconscious. But chloroform, if inhaled too suddenly, could stop the heart and kill in an instant. Ether wasn't as deadly, but it was highly flammable. And remember, these doctors were frequently operating by candlelight and in tents made out of wooden fabric. So it was not an easy gig. So next slide, please. So let's go back to the Capitol building in April 1861 as the Civil War erupted. President Lincoln sent out a call for troops and thousands of volunteers and soldiers flooded into the city of Washington, DC. The country was not prepared for a massive military movement. And in a building designed and designated as the seat of American law, the Capitol was called into use as a barracks for 4,000 Union troops. So we see in this slide, uh, these are New York troops quartered in the building. I believe this is the Senate chamber. And next slide is the 8th Massachusetts, Reg Massachusetts Regiment living in the rotunda. So Washington, D.C. became one huge encampment. Troops were trained and drilled on the grounds of the Capitol, and, and they needed to be fed. Next slide. Um, the army rapidly constructed brick ovens in the basement of the Capitol, and it's estimated that during the war, 50 million loaves of bread were baked in it. But one organization that was housed in the Capitol building, the Library of Congress, was pretty upset about it. The librarians were really dismayed by the amount of smoke and soot that was generated by these ovens, fearing that it would damage the books. Eventually, the bakery was removed. Um, next slide, please. What else was changing in Washington? Well, here is an example of an early Civil War battle, uh, Manassas, Virginia, the first battle of Bull Run in 1861. There were almost 5,000 casualties on the field at the end of the battle, and the wounded and sick, many of whom had to make their own way to the city, um, and thousands more wounded and, and sick were brought to Washington. Uh, in this next slide, I, I want you to think of this as the waiting room for the surgical suite. This is an image that was repeated all over this country. Uh, and these guys are waiting for surgery, most of them wounded in a limb and, and awaiting an amputation. And when this all started, Washington had one basic building known as a hospital. It was a two-story brick building, about six rooms, and it had been used to isolate victims of smallpox to stem the contagion. In the next slide, we see they began to extemporize churches and public buildings as hospitals. Now, this is a good example. They would take over a church. Sometimes they did this within three days. They would put boards over the pews, create a new floor, and move in the beds. So a lot of public and government buildings, including this next slide, the patent office, were used as hospitals. The patent office was quite a sizable hospital. And as the Union was in desperate need for places to care for these thousands of wounded, in August of 1862, the military requisitioned the capital for use as a hospital. You can see in this uh, next slide, um, beds were set up in the corridors in the area that's now known as National Statuary Hall and in the rotunda. And the rotunda could handle, uh, it's estimated from 1,000 to 1,200 patients at a time. Now, this illustration is a painting by the artist Alan Cox it's one of his wall and ceiling murals in the U.S. Capitol building. Well, this building was used as a hospital until October of 1862 when the patients were transferred to facilities that were outside the city. So in the next slide, 
we will talk about what else was happening in Washington to create the devastating conditions that were going on. So we're getting thousands of refugees, people from battlefield areas, women and children whose husbands and fathers had gone to the war and not reappeared. Uh, in the next slide, we'll see freed and escaped slaves who arrived by the thousand. And, and this next slide is as well, they, these were people with nothing or less than nothing. And they needed shelter, they needed food, clothing, and they needed medical care. In the next slide, we'll see there were no buildings set up for this. So this is what's known as a contraband camp. Contraband being a term derogatory that was applied to escaped slaves and what it meant was um, stolen property. So this is a contraband camp, which really it was tent set up in the mud. This is an actual Civil War period photograph. Uh, it's a stereoscope slide. There was a little machine you fed these into and it, it looked 3D. Well, how is Congress going to address this mess? I want to talk about the differences that were made by acts of Congress, not just for the advancement of medicine itself, but also changes that were related to individual doctors and nurses and volunteers, healthcare workers, in ways that had a revolutionary impact on the country. Next slide, please. When the Civil War started in 1860, there were no ambulances in America, military or civilian. If you got run over by a horse and wagon in the middle of the main street of your town or city, you hoped that some good Samaritan would scrape you up or somebody would get word to your family to come get you. And in the first of those Civil, civil War battles, as I mentioned, the wounded lay on those battlefields for up to a week awaiting rescue and evacuation. And one thing that they did do was to commandeer supply wagons as ambulances. So what happened was they would be bringing in supplies. They would dump them by the side of the road in order to be able to use the wagons to get these wounded men out of there. Um, so it was expensive. It was wasteful. They lost the supplies. It was extreme discomfort for these already grievously injured men. And it was chaos. I want to show you one comparison and remind you with this next slide that this war was 160 years ago. This is not the time of the pharaohs. This is four generations ago. So this is what the inside of an ambulance looks like today, 160 years later. So there's some pretty significant progress on our part. Next slide, please. Well, this situation was chaotic and horrific. And Dr. Jonathan Letterman was the medical director of the Army of the Potomac. He was a surgeon who had served in the army since 1849. So he was not only an experienced doctor, but an experienced soldier. Well, Dr. Letterman proposed the creation of an ambulance corps. He was inspired by the work of Dr. Dominique Jean Larry, the French surgeon and military doctor who had served for years in the Napoleonic Wars in Europe in the late 1700s and early 1800s. Uh, next slide, we can meet Dr. Larry. He is often called the father of modern day ambulance service and the father of modern day military medicine. Now, Dr. Larry introduced the first purpose built ambulances and also the, for the triage system of sorting the wounded. And he helped to tra treat and save thousands of lives on the Napoleonic battlefield. This next slide shows you a drawing of one of his designated vehicles for removing the wounded from the field of battle. And this the slide after this is, is a, uh, look at this fancy thing, enclosed, no less. <laughs> uh, um, so Larry also believed that rapid treatment of the wounded was extremely important, not just for the survival of the injured men, but to the morale of all the troops. Well, the uh, slide please, based on Larry's concepts in 1862, 
two, Dr. Jonathan Letterman created a revolutionary ambulance system and army supply system in America for the first time. And then in March of 1864, Congress published General Orders 106. It was an act, Public 22, to create an ambulance for, for all the Union armies. This next slide will show an actual dedicated vehicle designed to transport troops. And then we start to get, no, next slide, please, uh, more sophisticated uh, vehicles. And one more slide. And it, within less than two years, there were ambulance trains. Now, what you see here, they're lined up on a battlefield waiting. They made appointments for battles. So they are lined up, an ambulance train here, ready with train drivers and stretcher carriers to evacuate wounded men as quickly as those wounds occurred and get them out of there. Well, I want to introduce you to another union doctor who affected congressional change going outside of the hospitals. This is Dr. Alexander Thomas Augusta. He was born in the state of Virginia, freeborn, uh, and as a child, he had seen a doctor in action, and he just knew that was what he wanted to do. Well, Virginia, like some other southern states, had really strict literacy laws, or more accurately, anti-literacy laws. If you were a person of color in that state, you were expressly forbidden by law to learn to read and write. So when uh, Dr. Augusta got to be a young man, next slide please, he moved to Toronto, Canada with his wife, where they were not, it was a 180 in Canada there. Um, they were not only welcomed, in some cases they were celebrated. And he opened an apothecary after having been accepted to the medical school there. And he used the apothecary to support himself and his wife and his education in Toronto, Canada. Well, when the Civil War began, Dr. Augusta wrote a letter to President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, we'll see him in the next slide. He, um, it was really quite a battle for him to get accepted uh, as a member of the U.S. Army. And they went back and forth with him. They said, sure, come. No, don't come. Okay, we're setting up a meeting. No, we're canceling the meeting. It went on for months. But finally, Dr. Alexander Thomas Augusta was inducted into the United States Army at the rank of major. I want to point out when he left the Army, it was at the rank of Brevet Lieutenant Colonel. Um, and he went to work with the Contraband Hospital in Washington, D.C., well, he had a pretty significant event. We'll see in the next slide. He was on a streetcar in Washington, D.C., wearing his Union Army uniform. And it was raining heavily, and the people inside the streetcar were trying to force him outside onto an outer platform where it was pouring rain <clears throat> and off the vehicle, uh, owing to the color of his skin. So he was distraught and furious, and he wrote a letter of protest to President Lincoln asking for the protection of African-American families on public transportation. Well, that letter found its way to Republican Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, who was also enraged by the incident, and he took action, and he took that action to Congress. Well, in March 1865, Congress passed legislation making racial discrimination on streetcars illegal in Washington, D.C. Well, Dr. Augusta's lifetime efforts on behalf of justice sparked many other changes in American law and tradition. In 1864, his Army surgeon's pay was dramatically reduced based on racial issues. So he wrote another letter decrying the iniquity of pay for black soldiers, and he sent it to Republican Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, who was chairman of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs. And the senator championed Dr. Augusta's request, and in June 1864, Congress established equal pay regardless of color 
for United States soldiers. And in this next slide, we'll see another first. Dr. Augusta became the first Black hospital administrator in America, the first Black member of a university hospital medical school faculty. You see him here at Howard University. And when he died, he was the first African-American officer to be interred at Arlington National Cemetery. In this next slide, we are going to see a very popular act of Congress from very early in the war, which approved the formation of the U.S. Army uh, Medical Cadet Corps in August of 1861. And this act was titled an act for the better organization of the military establishment. So the cadet corps was a group of medical students who were detailed to the army as wound dressers, ambulance attendants, and just to do give whatever help that they could give to the doctors. And they were given the same rank as pay as West Point's military cadets. So these young guys were assisting doctors who had no training in trauma medicine and surgery. And many of the cadets learned right alongside the doctors. So as they all gained skills, many of these cadets actually made treatment decisions and performed surgery themselves when conditions were pretty dire. Uh, this is a new slide, please. Um, the cadets were between the ages of 18 and 23, and they seemed from their writings to have retained a sense of gallows humor in some cases. One cadet, uh, Ed Edward Curtis, composed a song about the Corps that reflected a surprisingly upbeat attitude. I'm just going to read you one verse. We're the medcads gay and happy, summoned from our homes to save by the surgeon's holy mission wounded warriors from the grave. Well, sometimes Congress grants a different kind of confirmation or honor, a reparation, a blessing, rather than a formal act. In this next slide, we are going to talk about the women in America. Well, American women in 1860 were, were classified as the sentimental domestic idea. They were supposed to be prim, pious, obedient, weak, and they were supposed to stay in the background. They were not welcomed in business. They were not welcomed or accepted in medicine. And there's one little story that to me sums up the American uh, attitude towards women at this point in time. Well, early in the war, the uh, Battle of Shiloh in Tennessee had huge numbers of casualties. And some women in the Confederacy were horrified and they wanted to help. So 40 Confederate women who probably had never been more than two or three miles away from their homes until then got together. They got on a train and they went to Shiloh to offer to help in these horrible situations. Well, these hastily set up hospitals near Shiloh, they came to the first one and said, we're here to do whatever you need. And the doctor who was the head of that hospital refused them entrance and he said, no more women or flies will be admitted. So you get the idea. And nursing at the time was considered to be an unseemly occupation for American women. Unless you were nursing a family member in the home, that was okay, but it was not okay, considered okay for women to touch the bodies of people who were not part of their immediate families. The, in this slide, the British Florence Nightingale was the a pioneer in creating a professional field of skilled nursing care. So in the 1850s, there was a horrible war in the Crimea and Florence had a lot of theories that she wanted to put into use. She was highly educated and a brilliant woman. She was an amazing observer and a data analyst. And she had some very specific ideas about healthcare, which she was focused on improving in our world. So she went to the Crimea and it was her moment and she grabbed it. There was really no one in the hospitals to, it was just chaos. So her ideas included 
cleanliness of the building and of the patients. She felt that medication and meals should be delivered on a schedule, and she was strongly a believer in good ventilation. Well, every place that Florence put these theories into action, the death rate plummeted. And when she went back to England after that war, she started training other women in these techniques, and she set up a school for nurses. Now, we didn't have that in America at all. There were no nursing schools in America until actually long after the Civil War. Um, and nurses in the American military were usually men who could not fight owing to medical or psychological reasons. So the healthcare situation was desperate in our country. So who are you going to call? Well, new slide, please. The only group of women in America who had any serious training in healthcare were the Catholic nuns, some of whom had worked with Florence Nightingale in Europe. But there was a really terrible situation existing. Um, new slide, please. There was very strong anti-Catholic sentiment in America. And in, 18, in the 1840s, uh, we had the Know Nothing Riots, the nativists, who were an anti-immigration group. Well, in Philadelphia, they burned Catholic churches. It was, it, it was a devastating occurrence. St. Augustine's in Philadelphia, they, they burned a church and they broke in and took all the books out of the library, made a huge pile in the street and burned them in a big bonfire. So in this next slide, you can see the burning of St. Michael's Church in the Kensington area of Philadelphia. The hatred of Catholics and nuns in particular was very strong and nuns were fearful of appearing in public in their traditional habits. Um, but President Lincoln requested aid from the Catholic Sisterhood, some of whom had already unbidden begun appearing to help on, on the battlefields. Um, in this next slide, uh, the nuns were willing to work extraordinarily long hours. They would treat patients with communicable diseases like smallpox, yellow fever, they asked for little for themselves, and it is estimated that at least 20% of all the nuns in America, which equaled about 600 to 700 at a minimum of the sisters, served in the Civil War. And this next image is really um, where you see how their behavior and caring and compassionate health care it transcended cultural and gender boundaries. And in this image, this is something you would never have seen two or three years earlier, where um, it's, it's probably from one of the weekly newspapers, uh, Harper's Weekly or Frank Leslie's Illustrated, and it's showing a nun in a really angelic um, portrayal as a healer and a comforter. So there began to be a great deal of affection for them among the soldiers and more among the public. So uh, with the blessing of Congress, we'll show you the next slide, the Nuns of the Battlefield Monument was erected in Washington, D.C. in 1924 in commemoration of the service of the hundreds of women from the many religious orders who had served in the Civil War. This sculpture, which is actually four-sided, was uh, created by the Irish artist Jerome Connor, and it's located outside the Cathedral of St. Matthew the Apostle. I want to read you the inscription. They comforted the dying, nursed the wounded, carried hope to the imprisoned, gave in his name a drink of water to the thirsty. To the memory and in honor, of the various orders of sisters who gave their services as nurses on battlefields and in hospitals during the Civil War, erected with the blessing of Congress. Well, we get something else from the Civil War in this next slide. We get the Medal of Honor. It is first awarded in 1861 by the Navy, followed the following year by uh, awards by the 
Army. Now, this is our country's highest military award for bravery. It is awarded by the president in the name of Congress, and it is known widely as the Congressional Medal of Honor. Well, there was one recipient of this honor who was highly unusual. We'll meet her in the next slide. Um, she is Dr. Mary Edwards Walker from New York State, educated at Syracuse. She was a wild woman with a larger than life personality and actions to match. She was a surgeon. She got behind enemy lines, was captured as a prisoner of war. She was a spy for the Union. She was a feminist and a suffragist. She was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Andrew Johnson in November of 1865. And to this date, in this year, 2023, she is the only woman ever to have been awarded this honor. Well, sometimes Congress may re-examine a situation many years later. And this next slide, in Harriet Tubman's case, it took more than 100 years. Now, Harriet Tubman, who was born into slavery, and we know her as the daring conductor on the Underground Railroad, remembered as a hero who risked her life to lead hundreds of enslaved people to freedom. And she was also a spy and a scout who risked her life for the Union. And the next slide, we see her um, be with some of the people that she's leading to freedom. Now, she is also someone who was very important to health care during and after the Civil War. Harriet Tubman was a gifted and compassionate nurse who reportedly cared for thousands of soldiers, black and white. She was highly skilled in the use of herbal medicine, and she was legendary for her ability to cure dysentery, which was frequently fatal. Well, in 1865, after the war, Harriet Tubman was appointed the matron of a hospital in Port Monroe, Virginia, for sick and wounded black soldiers. And in the next slide, we'll see her uh, pension request. Now, it was many years after the war, and actually 34 years after her first application for a pension, when at age 79, she was finally able to secure a pension from the government for her wartime work. However, it was a widow's pension from her marriage to Nelson Davis, who had been a soldier, and it fell under the Dependent and Disability Pension Act of 1890. Well, nine years later, she was awarded an additional $20 a month, um, but her, serve, her work as a spy and scout was never compensated. However, in this next slide, 20 years ago, in the year 2003, the U.S. Congress approved an additional posthumous pension of $11,750 that was intended to make up for the lack of appropriate payments during her lifetime. The compensatory funds were allocated to the maintenance of Harriet Tubman's historical sites. Well, sometimes Congress was able to respond to smaller, more specific, and local humanitarian health-based requests. So let's meet Annie Turner Wittenmeyer. She was a widow from Iowa and a lifelong philanthropist and reformer. When the war broke out, she organized a soldier's aid society. She visited army camps. She collected hospital supplies from local associations. And eventually, she devoted herself to the Volunteer United States Christian Commission, and she focused on developing special diet kitchens for the first time in Un Union Army hospitals. And Annie's uh, had noticed that uh, many young soldiers appeared to be suffering or dying from malnutrition. So she wanted to improve what nutrition they were getting, and she trained other women to do the same work. So um, new slide, please. By the end of the war, they had created almost 100 diet kitchens in large military hospitals, and the Union Army Medical Department began to incorporate 
Mrs. Wittenmeyer's ideas as a necessary part of healing. Here you see they published pamphlets with her recipes. They were serious about what was contributing to the better health of the soldiers. Well, after the war, she shifted her attention to the orphaned children of soldiers who were killed in the war. She founded orphanages and back in her home area of Davenport, Iowa, she requested that the government donate the then unused army barracks in Davenport as an orphan's home. And you can see it in our next slide. Um, she, they, knew, they knew Annie Wittenmeyer in Washington and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton responded to her requests. He went and applied to Congress for bed linens, pillows, and other items to provide comfort to the children in the orphan's home. And Congress approved the transfer of the unused army camp and its equipment to the Iowa Soldiers Orphans Association in January of 1866. Uh, next slide, please. I, I hope you've enjoyed meeting our forebearers, really, who exhibited such incredible bravery and I, I hope you'll read and enjoy my book and get to know more of our American ancestors and the legacy they left us of courage and compassion, of tenacity in horrible conditions. And under these horrific conditions, these were people who sought to save lives and improve lives. And they show us the picture of Americans at their best, of our great national capacity for caring. They are part of our heritage and our inspiration. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm happy to try to answer any questions that I can. Well, thank you, Carol. This has certainly been fascinating. We've learned a, a great deal about uh, the development of sanitation, of understanding nutrition and the role in diseases, not to mention the complexity of the machines um, and the guns and, and other weapons. So we have a very few minutes. So I would encourage you to answer the questions as briefly as possible because we have several questions from folks um, about the, the Catholic nuns who were so much a part of the, the treatment. Um, were they French Ursuline nuns or were they from a different order? Do you know the difference of that? Because uh, one of our listeners says there, you know, there was a lot of French Ursuline nuns in Richmond. There were, but there were more than a dozen different orders. The Sisters of Charity um, at, from Emmitsburg, Maryland, from orders really across the country. And and the, the French nuns who did come over, there were a lot of um, nuns who had immigrated, and, and some of them, fortunately for us, had worked with um, Florence Nightingale in Europe. So yes, the Ursuline, the French Ursuline nuns were part of it, but the Daughters of St. Joseph, the Sisters of Charity, um, everybody really kicked in. That's great. Um, Carol, can you just speak up a little bit? There's some folks having difficulty hearing. Um, so tell us about the role of African Americans uh, as medical providers. How did that influence the activity? Well, there, I've been able to find evidence of 13 trained African-American medical doctors. The problem was that most medical schools would not admit them owing to the color of their skin. So many went, were trained in Canada and a lot of volunteers, I mean, once um, there were more black troops, escaped slaves, women, um, who joined and served as nurses. And these are not people with any formal training. Um, so it became a pretty widespread movement among African-Americans to support the black troops, to nurse them. And there was a real scarcity, you can see, of, of actual trained medical doctors. But under the hideous conditions, an awful lot of people assisted 
caught on quickly and went to work. And so I have not found any instances where black soldiers were not able to be treated by either white or black doctors. Everybody, it was just an incredible situation of people rising to the horrible occasion, black and white. And you didn't mention Clara Barton um, and the uh, Red Cross, which I understand happened at the same time. And how would you like to say something about, about her and the Red Cross as part of the effort? Absolutely. I, you know, I, I debated about including Clara because she is one of the big heroes in a number of ways. But the American Red Cross did not come into being. Um, Congress did not allow it till many years after the war. So Clara Barton, uh, sometimes we hear her referred to as a nurse, but she preferred to think of herself as a relief worker. And she really, uh, she testified before Congress about the conditions in the prison uh, camps. She really, for somebody who was so shy that the neighbors suggested her mother have her trained as a teacher in order to overcome her shyness, she just sort of mustered it together and she led the the motion to to get an awful lot of things happening she would go into battlefields she got permission to do it with supplies she never really allied herself with a specific volunteer organi organization not the united states sanitary organization the u.s christian commission but they all everybody respected and revered her and so I did not include the, um, I, I was trying to stay with what Congress got involved with in this particular talk. I, I talk a lot more about Clara in my book and, and the changes she affected, especially the American Red Cross, which was based on her experience after the war with the European Committee of the International Red Cross. So I would encourage you, I mean, she is a, a phenomenal example of an American hero, but that that's why I, I didn't speak about her specifically because it goes like literally decades later till we get the Red Cross in this country. And do you know, thank you. Um, do you know anything about uh, Frederick Law Olmsted and, and the role that he may have played in getting supplies? Frederick Law Olmsted, I love him. He was um, an American landscape architect, and he designed uh, parks and grounds really from Berkeley, California to Boston. Right, we just celebrated the 200th anniversary, so I think our folks are quite familiar with who he is. The question oh, okay. is, what role did he play in this particular drama? Ah, well, he was, at the time of the Civil War, he was uh, serving, he was one of the designers of Central Park in New York, which I, you probably know, um, and, and he was selected to be the Secretary of the United States Sanitary Commission, which was a huge volunteer uh, organization that sought to do what the government could not, and what the government could not do was get supplies in. They just, they weren't prepared for this massive event and the needs that went along with it. So he became the secretary of the United States Sanitary Commission. He went to Washington and he supervised the, um, they set up stations for the, the Sanitary Commission in different areas of the country. They supervised getting supplies into battlefields before and after the battles, and he oversaw all of that. He had been injured in a carriage accident, I believe it was, and so he was not able to serve physically as a soldier, but he was a hell of an organizer. And so he oversaw this massive volunteer effort. Again, I, I wrote at length about him. In, in healing a divided country, uh, healing a divided nation, but um, but yeah, without any training in that that when you thought about, I mean, he was a landscape architect, but he took over and he ran that organization of thousands of people throughout the war. And at that time, the sanitary commission was a relatively revolutionary idea. 
Um, so let us, you know, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, and many people have said, oh, come back and we'll keep going on. Um, but I, we will send people information about your book with the hope to get that. Um, but we want to make sure that we respect people's time. And we thank you so much for being here. We want to talk uh, to our readers and our listeners um, about the upcoming events because the United States Capitol Historical Society in these, these hot days of August, it's a good day to be inside watching a, watching a webinar. Um, and we have a, a fascinating uh, group of programs ahead. So thank you so much, uh, Carol, for being with us. And we hope that you will join us for some of the upcoming events, which are on your screen now, Absolutely. where we're talking about Birdman of the Senate uh, and the Migratory Bird Act. Um, we're gonna have a hybrid event, which is both in-person and, uh, and online about when the British invaded the Capitol. Um, and the year that broke politics, collusion and chaos in the presidential election of 1968, all coming up in the next few weeks. And so we encourage you to use the QR code, go to our website, join us for these things. And please remember that these seminars are only available because of the generosity of our members and donors. Uh, the United States Capitol Historical Society, while chartered by Congress and charged to tell the story of the Capitol and the people who work there in a manner that inspires informed patriotism, is supported by the donations, um, philanthropic donations of our members and friends. So we are thankful for your gifts, for your contributions. Carol, we are thankful to you for your time, for you donating your time to, to be with us and to answer questions. And to all of you who have listened, thank you for being with us. Have a wonderful day. Stay cool. Goodbye. Thank you.